The Bible reading this evening is from James, starting at chapter 1 and verse 12 to verse 18. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no man should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. This is God's word. Let's pray. You tell us in your word that no prophet or apostle was carried along by their own will, by their own desires, but each was moved by the Holy Spirit who came upon them and enabled them to record words that you wanted us to hear and be recorded. So we are grateful that we have this revelation given to us by you that culminates with the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for Jesus who gives us such a clear picture of who you are so that Jesus was able to say, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. We pray this evening that you would help us to understand how our faith grows And how we are meant to respond to who you are. For you have not given us this word simply to be read. But a word to be applied and integrated into our daily lives. So help us in that respect we pray. For we are a needy people. And we need your help. Amen. The way a pressure cooker works. Is that you put food into it, you put water into it, and then everything inside internally gets pressurized. And as a result of that pressure that is exerted through the closing and the sealing of that pressure cooker, you end up being able to cook things a lot quicker. And as a result, you can halve your cooking time on many things. In fact, you can even go less on some other things because of the pressure that is exerted, causing that food to cook a whole lot quicker. God sometimes puts us in the pressure cooker because he knows that only through pressure being exerted upon us that you and I are going to grow. And were he to leave us out there in an unpressured situation... Our growth would be slow and painful at times. And while for us that pressure is sometimes painful because sometimes God's uh, bringing certain circumstances into our life can be extremely difficult to have to endure. God not only gives us the grace to endure it, but through the endurance of it enables us to grow in our relationship with him and draws us closer to himself and gets rid of some of those things that would take forever to get rid of if God just left us to our own ends. 
Now we see a great illustration of this in Job in the Old Testament. Job, who's cruising, and he's cruising. Things are going well. He's blessed. He's got 10 sons and daughters. He's got cattle and sheep to spare. He's rich. He's wealthy. He's got everything we in this, our modern world would think that someone like that has arrived and sometimes we long for. And then God intervenes. And God intervenes by allowing Satan to come and disrupt his life and put pressure to bear upon him. So that Job gets so despondent in the end that he sits on the outskirts of the city in dust and ashes as a way of expressing his remorse, his grief. His friends come along and they just nail him even further and exacerbate his grief. They increase his grief to the point where God eventually rebukes his friends because they have said things that are untrue. But at the end of all of that, what does Job say to God? He says, once I've heard, I've spoken, twice, but no more. Now I've not only seen with my eyes, but now I've experienced, and I'm going to keep quiet. In other words, through the experience that Job has gone through, there has been a tremendous amount of growth in his own life. And then God blesses him over and above what he had prior to that. And James wants to remind us that the pressures that God allows us to endure are not there in order to crush us, though we may think that, but are there in order to grow us, and there is reward for perseverance. Look at verse 12. Firstly, the reward for enduring Testing, and I've used the word testing specifically. The reward for enduring testing, verse 12. Blessed is the man or woman who perseveres under trial, because when he or she has stood the test, he will receive or she will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So blessed, happy is the person who endures through persecution. Now there are some uh, through, uh, through difficulty. Now there are some who fall away when difficulties come. And so the reality of the lack thereof of their faith is exposed. Because it's only under pressure that we get to see what really lies beneath, what's really below. And here we are told there is the person who perseveres through their trial. And that perseverance, if I can quote from the original, means to absolutely and emphatically persevere under misfortunes and trials and to hold fast to one's faith in Christ. Now, it's important that I have used the word testing there because it is a difficult word to translate. This is almost like a transition verse between the previous verses and the succeeding verses. The word in the original can mean trial or can mean temptation. I think a neutral way of translating that in view of the context of this passage is testings. Because testings that God allows us to endure sometimes may then result in temptation. And we may be then tempted to react in certain kinds of ways that are not necessarily godly. And so I think it covers both sides of that. But what he's saying here is blessed is the one who continues to keep on keeping on in spite of the trials that they are enduring. This person, kind of person, is able to continue to steadfastly worship Jesus even when the pressure is ramped up. Now I know that when things are going well, you and I can easily articulate that, can't we? It's easy. It's easy to say, yep, things are going well. I'm happy to continue on in my faith. But let's say God were to take away your health. Let's say you were tomorrow to wake up with a terrible migraine that doesn't go away. And you go to a doctor, and he says, look, I think it might be more than just a migraine. Let's send you for MRI. 
and you were to go for an MRI, and that MRI would come back and say, you have an inoperable malignant brain tumor. And then you were to say to the doctor, well, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of the, the life that I have left? And the doctor were to say to you, six months at the most. Would you rejoice in your faith? Would you rejoice in the Lord? 1 Peter 4 verse 13 makes this declaration. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. You see, perseverance is really tested in the midst of the most difficult of trials. And James is saying there is an incredibly great reward for perseverance. We don't simply persevere because we have a kind of a, a stoic attitude. You know, we kind of just grit our teeth and through the gritted teeth we kind of say, well, we're just going to continue. But James wants to remind us that there's tremendous reward if we persevere. What is the reward? Well, the reward for those who withstand the test, and that withstanding of the test is just used in the original sense when coins are tested and proved to be genuine. It's the same here. When they, when they mint coins or they, they make the notes, if there are flaws in those coins or notes, they discard it. But when they have proved and when they have shown that they withstood the test of the testing, there is a reward. What is the reward? Well, he tells you. When he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, it's a very difficult phrase to understand. What exactly does the apostle mean by the crown of life? Now, it may be that he has in mind something to do with uh, the rewards in heaven, though it's much more likely that the crown of life is simply a way of saying that those who demonstrate perseverance through trials are assured of their salvation. Now we need to distinguish carefully here. What James is not saying is that the work of perseverance is the thing that secures your salvation. Because we cannot, in any sense, work for salvation. Salvation is a gift of God's grace. So when he talks about the crown of life, we mustn't think that, well, if I just put my head into the wind and I just persevere, that it's because of that perseverance that that's going to secure my salvation. Your salvation is secured by the work of Christ on the cross. What James is saying is that perseverance reveals the reality of the salvation of the person who is persevering. It is the perseverance of the saints by their own willingness to endure trials and not to fall away and not to drop out of Christianity is a revelation of the reality, the genuineness of their faith. So that perseverance is the expression of true salvation. Therefore, those who endure, those who persevere, are going to experience one day the eternal life that God has given to whom? He tells you. To all who love Him. To those who love Him. In other words, it's a universal reward that is given to all Christians who demonstrate perseverance they will receive the crown of life. It is nothing less than salvation eternally with God forever. And your perseverance proves that that is something that is genuine. And so the point is that we demonstrate the reality of our faith by our perseverance, which is an indication that we will receive the crown of life one day. Now, perseverance is not always simply easy to go through. I have witnessed over many years, and as you get older, those of you who are younger, you will also experience this, many different kinds of trials that people have to endure. 
Some of you may have parents already that have got certain trials or grandparents that are going through certain difficulties that come as you age. But trials are varied and diverse. Our response is to hang in there and to persevere for the reward outweighs the pain. Way back, and I'm really dating myself now, how many of you, just out of interest, have seen the movie Chariots of Fire? Uh, all the older people, all the, all the more mature people have seen Chariots of Fire. It was made in 1981, so those of you who are younger, you're forgiven. If you haven't seen it, go and hire it or go and uh, whatever you do. However you, you don't hire it anymore. Go and get it from iTunes or, or Apple or wherever and watch it or your Netflix or binge or I don't know. But there's a scene in that movie that is incredibly, in my view, moving. It's of Eric Little who was attempting to qualify for the 1924 Olympics. Eric Little was a Christian and after the Olympics became a missionary. And he, in order to qualify, he ran the 100, the 200, and the 400. He was in an athletic meeting where they were running the 400 meters, back then the 440 yards. And as the gun went off and they started that race, in order to try and, as they do, jostle and get into the inside lane, because obviously you, you, if you're on the outside lane, you're going to run further. He stumbled and tripped over another athlete in the race, and he fell to the ground. And as he was on the ground, there's a race official there shouting, get up, get up. And now the rest of the athletes and his main competition was about 20 meters in front of him. That's what he lost. And he got up and he began to run. And you see in that, it's an incredible scene. I get quite moved even thinking about it. You see this, this athlete running and every fiber, every muscle in his body is strained to the absolute maximum. And as they begin to go around, slowly but surely he begins to gain and gain and gain that 20 or so meters that he's lost. Till eventually, as he gets to within the finish line, there's, he's managed to get level with the pack. And there's, as he gets to the finish line, in one last desperate effort, he puts all what he has left into straining and he just pips his rival over the finish line and collapses on the ground. And the medical team have to come and run and help him because of the collapse an article appearing the next day in the newspaper said this. The circumstances in which Little won the race made it a performance bordering on the miraculous. Veterans whose memories take them back 35 years and in some cases longer in the history of athletics were unanimous in the opinion that Little's win in the 400 meters was the greatest track performance they had ever seen. There's something glorious about being knocked down in the trials of life, in the testings of life, and getting up, and with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, persevering, continuing to go with every energy in your body, fueled by God's grace, for we are not left to endure these things by ourselves, strengthened by God. Pushing on, persevering, tears running down your face at times, but enduring for the reward of heaven one day. Secondly, notice the acceptance of responsibility for sinning. This is so important. Look at verses 13 and 14. The acceptance of the responsibility for sinning. Verse 13 and 14. When tempted... Now he switches. Now as a result of temp, uh, uh, testings, temptation comes knocking at the door. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt 
anyone. But when each one is tempted, when by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Due to these testings, sometimes the temptation is to want to sin. For example, if your body is racked with disease, we may be tempted to want to say, but Lord, don't you really love me? Why are you allowing me to experience this disease? Or when we are exhausted and feel as though we can't continue, we may be tempted to say, but Lord, you said your grace is sufficient, but I'm not experiencing your grace right now. Or when perhaps our circumstances are so dire that we are struggling financially to make ends meet, we may accuse God and say, but Lord, you said you're, you, you will provide for all of my needs, and yet my needs are not being provided for. Or perhaps when we are tempted by a sinful situation of getting involved in a, a relationship that is going to be contrary to our, our beliefs biblically, we may say, but Lord, you promised that you wouldn't let me be tested beyond what I can endure, but this test was too great, and so I succumbed to temptation. And James wants to say, don't you ever accuse God and blame God for yielding to temptation. When you yield to temptation, it is your own fault. Take responsibility for it. We are living in a times when no one wants to take responsibility for anything. It's always someone else's fault. And even those who commit atrocious acts of crimes against others blame their upbringing. You know, it's the, it's, it's the parents I had. It's their fault that I got involved in exploiting uh, a teenager in a sexual realm. And, and, and everything gets blamed on someone else. It's their fault. Or if you, in the words of that South African cricketer who got involved in gambling, Hansi Cronier, you might remember, what did he say? The devil made me do it. It's not my fault, it's the devil's fault. And so we just blame everything else for our sinning. And James says, don't do it. You are responsible. You yield to temptation. You put yourself in the position where you fail to resist. It's not a failure of God's grace. It's a failure of your weakness in succumbing to temptation and not trusting in God to provide a means by which you can bear up under that temptation. And don't say that it's God bringing the temptation into your realm. Don't say, Lord, you've tempted me. Because God cannot tempt anyone. Why can't God tempt anyone? Because God is holy. And what that means is God is absolutely pure. There is no sin in God. There is no possibility of God introducing a sinful situation into the life of a human being. Yes, God is sovereign over it all. Yes, no sin can happen or no evil can happen outside the umbrella of God's sovereignty. What we need to realize and understand is the way in which God works in relation to good and evil. All evil is our responsibility. We can evil when we decide to yield to temptation. All good comes from God. And so God has an asymmetrical relationship to good and evil. Everything good comes from God. Everything evil comes from us. And you can't blame God and tell him it's his fault that you sinned. Notice how he puts it. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God cannot be tempted. God's character prevents him from being tempted. If God were in any sense tempted by evil or tempted you with evil, he would cease to be God. And he would become like one of us. And that's impossible for God. All of his characters working together the whole time in sync with each other. His holiness, his love, his mercy, his compassion, his righteousness, all working together. And none of those things can change. Remember when David is tempted in 1 Chronicles 21.1 to tempted to take a census 
And even though God oversees that entire process, the responsibility for David yielding to the temptation to take a census, which results in the slaughter of a whole lot of uh, Israelites, is David's fault. He can't point a finger to God and say, you made me do it. It's so easy for us to blame other things, isn't it? It's so hard sometimes to acknowledge our own responsibility in our sinful sinfulness. But here it's clear. When we fall prey to temptation, when we yield, let's accept that responsibility. Let's fly to the cross. Let's go to the foot of the cross and there let us confess our sin. And confession of sin means that you and I agree with God on the verdict that he has passed on our sin. We say, yes, Lord, you are right, we are wrong. Now forgive us, O God, for your blood or the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So when you find yourself in a situation where temptation overpowers you, don't try and excuse it. Don't try and blame it on someone else. But take full responsibility for it and fly to the cross. There is forgiveness at the cross. Thirdly, I want you to notice the progressive stages of temptation. Look at verses 14 and 15. Verses 14 and 15. Uh, and we'll pick up from uh, the second part of verse 14. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he or she is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Though it is not a sin to be tempted, we must distinguish between the two. Temptations come to us all the time, and it's not a sin for you to experience temptation. The sin is only to yield to temptation. We must keep that difference clear. He outlines the process. It begins with an evil desire, the desire to want to sin. And when you think back to the Garden of Eden, of sinning, what happened with Eve, the very first sin? She looked at the fruit. It looked desirable. Why was it desirable? What was desirable for food? It was desirable because it looked good. It was desirable because it promised certain things. It meant that they would be able to distinguish the difference between good and evil. And so there was some benefit to be gained. And that desire grew and grew and grew till eventually it overwhelmed her. And she dragged along her husband who was there present with her and should have stepped in but failed to exercise the role that God had given him of caring and protecting and nurturing his wife. Thus Paul says in Romans that Adam is responsible for his failure to exercise the God-given role of leadership he should have. But here it talks about cravings, and the emphasis is on being lured. In fact, the word that is used there is the word bait that was used for fish. When you put a lure on a, a, on a hook, now sometimes that might be live bait, sometimes it might be something that looks like a fish in the water, and you cast it so that a fish swimming below the surface sees it and is lured, and as they bite, they get hooked. That's what he talks about in terms of the desire. It then continues with deception. We begin to rationalize, don't we? Eve was deceived by the fruit. She thought that it was going to give her some kind of benefit. And there was something she gained from it and Adam gained. What did they gain? The knowledge of good and evil. Was that a good gain? No. But they thought it was going to benefit them. And that's what happens with deception. Sin deceives us into thinking there is something you're going to benefit from this. And there may be a sense of benefit, but there's no long-lasting contentment. There's only unhappiness and sadness and destruction as a result. 
For God who created us, who knows us, who fashioned us in our mother's womb, knows what's good for you and he knows what's not good for you. And when we are deceived, we are deceived because we fail to trust the word of God who instructs us and gives us principles by which we are to live. And we just allow ourselves to be deceived into thinking that somehow the temptation that Satan presents us with is greater wisdom than what God has revealed in his word. And we buy into the lie. And we allow ourselves to be dragged away. Notice that temptation is attractive. You would not be tempted if it were not attractive. A man would not commit adultery if he knew that that adulterous relationship was going to destroy his marriage, destroy his family. But it's the lure of the, the excitement of an extramarital affair that he thinks he's going to gain some benefit or she thinks she's going to gain some benefit from that causes them to enter into it. They don't think about the consequences. It's all about the moment. It's all about now. It's all about me. It's all about the self-gratification. That's what sin is, isn't it? It's all about what I want, and I want it now. We live in a world that seeks self-gratification. Next, it moves to design. Now, once we've rationalized and we've given good reasons why it's okay and we've made that decision, we then begin to make plans on how we are going to fall prey to that temptation. So let's just take an example. This, I could have, there, there are any number of examples. The desire to look at pornography raises its ugly head. The deception is that we're going to get some kind of pleasure from it. Then we begin to make plans to watch pornography by getting on a computer or an iPad or an iPhone or whatever phone you've got. And we allow ourselves to be sucked into it. And plans are made and conceived as to how we are going to enter into the situation. And then that finally results after design into disobedience, where we go ahead and we disobey God and we rebel against God's standards and we succumb to the temptation. Disobedience results in frustrated relationship with Jesus. You will never find contentment in your relationship with Christ if you continue to live in disobedience to him. You won't. You'll be a frustrated Christian. You'll be an unhappy Christian. You'll be a depressed Christian. You'll be a disillusioned Christian. And Christianity will be hard. Temptation makes great promises, but it always fails to deliver. It never gives what we promise. It only leads to pain, dissatisfaction, and sadness. So, when you are tempted, recognize it for what it is. Understand that it's not going to bring any kind of lasting benefit to your life that you are not going to gain anything by it that brings you contentment or deep-seated satisfaction, that all that temptation is going to do is hurt you, cause you to be out of sync with the Lord Jesus Christ, cause your relationship with Him to be affected and outwardly relationships to be affected. There is nothing to gain by it. Remember that no matter how exciting it may seem, that when we engage in it, we will reap the consequences of it. So when you're tempted for that juicy morsel of gossip, stay away. Walk away. Don't enter into it. Damage will result. When you're tempted to lie, don't indulge in that temptation. It may get you out of a sticky situation but it won't bring you any contentment with Jesus. 
When you're tempted and you're out at a party and enjoying yourself, don't overindulge so that you end up getting drunk. Because that won't bring you any lasting contentment. When you're at work and you're working in a particular situation and the temptation is not to do your work or to be lazy because you're working from home or no one's watching what you're doing and you're tempted to waste time by going and doing other things that are not work-related, don't allow yourself to get dragged into that temptation. Give to your boss what is due to him or her. When you get tempted sexually and the devil says, no one's going to know. You can do it in the privacy of your own home, behind closed doors. Don't fall prey. Many marriages have been destroyed because of that and relationships destroyed and individuals destroyed. Young men, let me say this to you. The more you indulge in pornography, the more it will desensitize you sexually and the more frustrated you will become. And one day, God willing, when you get married, it will affect your relationship sexually with your wife. And woman, the same is true of you. The proof is unquestioned. It rewires your brain. They know this. Don't get lured. There's nothing to be gained. And then fourthly and finally, I want you to notice the perfect consistency of God. Look at verses 16 to 18. The perfect consistency of God. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting of shadows, he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be kind of first fruits of all that he created. It's a tremendous way to finish this because here is the flip side. Here is the, the positive, the negative he's dealt with. Now he goes to the positive. What does he tell us? He tells us that God is a God who is absolutely consistent. So that every time he acts towards us, we can be absolutely assured that we will receive the same treatment from God day to day, month to month, year to year, decade to decade. God does not shift and change like us. God does not have a temper that he loses when we sin. God does not suddenly change his mind that he's going to treat us nicely now and then treat us horribly there because of something we've done. But the way that God's goodness and character is expressed is always the same. You know, one of the things that I get um, often, or not often, but sometimes told about in refereeing, I as some of you know, our referee rugby union, is the players make quite clear what they want from you is consistency in how you referee. If I'm blowing penalties for offsides for one team and ignore the other team when they're offsides, it gets the other the team who are not uh, who are being penalised very unhappy. And they'll come to me, and the captain will say to me, "Sir, but but when they're offsides, you're not penalising them." God is never inconsistent in terms of how he applies himself. And he reminds us here that every good gift that you receive, and remember, God is an exceptionally generous God. Every good gift without exception comes from God. Every good gift. So when you are blessed in this world by something good, it is because of God's generosity that he is exercising towards you. And God, who is immutable, he, what that means is that God in his character cannot change. And I've said this before, so let me repeat it and say it again. If God could change, it would say that he's not perfect. Because the possibility would exist that he could change for the better. And God cannot change for the better. And God cannot change for the worse. 
Because God is as good as he will ever be and is perfectly good all of the time. So he's immutable. He doesn't change like the shifting of shadows. He doesn't change like the lights in the sky that at night we see and then as the sun begins to rise, they begin to fade. No, God always treats us in exactly the same way. And that should give us great confidence. Notice what else he talks about. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be kinds of first fruit of all that he's created. So in other words, what James now says, let's think about the goodness of God in where it is most experienced. It is most experienced in that he has drawn us to himself and enabled us to have a relationship with himself, has given us eternal life, has rescued us from our sin, brought us into the kingdom of God from the kingdom of Satan, that one day we will dwell with him eternally. We are the first fruits of what? We are the first fruits of the gospel. As the gospel is proclaimed, remember he's speaking now to this group of Jews who have been dispersed and sent out outside of Palestine. He's saying, you, Gent- you, you Jews, you Gentiles uh, who have been saved, you are the first fruits of the application of the gospel. You have experienced what it means to be, have a birth into a new life. You have come to Christ God has birthed them. Hear what he says. Given us birth through the word of truth. In other words, as the gospel has gone out, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, has taken the word of God, applied it into the lives of those to whom it has gone, and as a result, they've been supernaturally born again. And they are the first fruits of the gospel. What greater gift can you and I experience than the gift of of eternal life. That is the greatest expression that God can give us in the giving of His Son to die on a cross so that you and I can enter into life. If you want to know or if you want to have proof of the goodness of God, look no further than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It tells you everything you need to know about who God is. And thus, no matter what happens to us in this life, we celebrate our God who is unchangeable, who gives good gifts to his children. You know, the story uh, is told by W. Sangster. Some of you might have heard this before. W. E. Sangster was a Methodist minister who lived during the Second World War in England and pastored a Methodist church in London. Very godly man. During the German, that uh, time when they, uh, in the beginning part of the war, remember when they flew over and they bombed London? Went on for about six months and the bombs were falling and they had to evacuate certain parts of London. Well, it was one of those bombing nights that in the middle of the night, he had a loud banging on his door. And as he opened his door, there was a a man standing there from his congregation with tears running down his face. Looking at Sangster and said to him, Sangster, where was your God when my son was killed tonight? And Sangster looked at him in the eye and said, the same place he was 2,000 years ago when his son was killed. God hasn't changed. God doesn't treat us differently to the way in which he treats his son. God is consistent. God's love is consistent. God's grace is consistent. God's compassion is consistent. God's goodness is consistent. And so you and I can walk in confidence in our faith, knowing that we don't have a God who has accepted us when we turn to him in repentance and faith and now will suddenly cast us away. 
but a God who holds us to himself, come what may. And when we are in the most deepest trial and we are weeping, he enfolds his arms of love around us and says to us, I love you. My love hasn't changed. You're just as precious now as you were when things were going well. And I'm not treating you any differently to the way that I would treat my son. What a God. What a God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the way in which you have revealed yourself to us in your Son and how we have seen your goodness firsthand through his life, his death, his resurrection. Thank you for drawing us to yourself. And thank you that in the midst of the greatest of testings that we experience in this world, we can endure with you. Help us to persevere. Help us never to give up. Help us to draw on your grace. And when we are tempted to sin, and when on those occasions we do yield to sin, help us not to blame anyone else, but to accept responsibility and to seek your forgiveness. But we pray that you would help us to recognize temptation for what it is, to resist it, to flee from it, to allow you to strengthen us to walk away, that we might walk in the paths, the good paths that you have laid out before us. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing song.